I realized there was an amazing correlation between the problems, at least in my case, that I've been seeing for the past 20 years in um, finance and treasury management and the opportunities that that blockchain could give. And it um, had to do with basically a new way of people and businesses exchanging value. My name is Paul Mewson. I'm a director in finance at Swiss Re. I am responsible for our finance and treasury services and we operate them in two regional centers, one in Asia and one in Europe. The internet has allowed us for 20 years to exchange information, but that is largely still copying information and just copying is not a good idea with value unless you are the national bank that is allowed to print money. So we started first internally and looked at an internal process. Actually, within a large insurance company like ours, we even have reinsurance amongst us. So we blockchain that in a prototype. And then some months later, as different companies started to get together to exchange experiences, very much in an open source thinking, we share that with many others in the industry. And as things have evolved, we now have 15 members in an initiative called um, Blockchain Insurance Industry Initiative, or short name called B3I. We have to all, with humbleness, admit that our financial service industry has rather been focused going towards what we call with nice terms, the high net worth individuals that our financial service industry, when it got into troubles, was also not quite by going out and, and helping with micro microfinance to the underprivileged, was rather with under other complicated transactions that normal people find hard to understand. So that and a number, number of reasons is actually not a great start for many in financial services to claim that they are the party to go to, they are the party to trust when you actually want to bring banking and insurance services to the 90% that don't have it. There's also a, a new reason, this is where very, in a very fascinating way, something like blockchain comes in, is that this new technology now actually brings an opportunity that you do not really need a third party anymore as a central authority when we want to do a trade. You now have technically actually this opportunity that when we want to exchange a value, a currency that we use that can be verified by us or by a community of us by using actually trust that is embedded in that network. So what we have actually is a coming together of two interesting phenomena. Number one, that people have some questions whether it's always that third party banking institution that's the only one to go through, which is frankly somewhat the oligopoly. And number two, that technology seems to really clearly show also that there is an alternative. And I think we are all also in the financial service industry trying to recognize that we don't have to be defensive of that, but we rather have, have to embrace not just this technology, but this enabler that it brings us to actually access a vastly underutilized or un undiscovered market um, that we have to really do business with on an eye-to-eye -eye level. Robots, Internet of Things, I still, still, still see as technologies that will surround this thing called mutual distributed ledger, which a blockchain is. That ledger has to obtain its information from somewhere so a robot can actually help you rather than human hands having to structure the data to do that for you and put it on the blockchain. Internet of Things, this can be a box in your car or a satellite above your farmland. Those can be also means to capture data so that you and I agree these are data that we neutrally can take as the basis of our contract. The loss has happened. I owe you a claim. So it is the uniqueness of this one ledger that we can trust, 
that has a mechanism of consensus, consensus finding that we don't necessarily need big brother govern, government for it. We also don't need some central bank or financial institution. This technology can very much be self-regulating. I find it's quite important to not look at this as some strange science fiction big machine that takes over, but rather something that is a common basis of trust, but we also feed it with very tangible small pieces of technology um, that actually feed that ledger with information from the real world in a way that we actually can transact um, and do business with each other. I do believe there is actually a much more agile approach that we apply. So we have a put, in, put, a put in place a plan that is much more an iterative plans of what we call iterative scrums or iterative sprints, where in about a handful of such sprints over the next half year, we will incrementally every time add a bit of more functionality and a bit of more technical sophistication. Step one will simply be that we set up a contract between these participating nodes or insurance companies and we make sure is that actually this, does that give us the same starting base as the way we used to do it in the pre-blockchain world. So a much more iterative driven, use case driven rather than a massive technology and financial investment hoping to be the holy grail as things evolve quite quickly. And with this iterative approach we hope to go step by step and, in, and also continuously share with the market. Even with those companies currently not actively involved, we, op we entertain a quite open dialogue to make sure that the focus that we have is actually the right one and we can evolve to other use cases as this first one uh, develops. It, it is true that the blockchain crowd is a little bit different. Um, here in Zurich, for example, I love to go a couple of times to these hackathon events and then you're there somewhere in a kind of a basement uh, type of office uh, underneath uh, this place called Hartbrücke. And, and it's quite refreshing. And so you get there on a Friday evening and people work there almost 48 hours and it's quite interesting how a very interesting mixed group of people from university engineer academics to people who are have good jobs in good big companies they rather than going off to the ski resort they spent doing their weekend doing that and i really found that was very fortunate to be part of that a couple of times so that is a little bit call it a pirate atmosphere or, or quite a new um, new vibe that is going on um, I believe it is, um, and it's, it's quite okay that people have that with different drivers. They may be very noble, like change the world type of drivers. Others actually come to it from a quite scientific point of view, that they truly have understood how this new technology can just make things better and more, more efficiently. Um, and it's quite an interesting public partner, public-private partnership. Um, and especially in big cities, several in Europe, also here in Zurich, that is taking shape. Uh, there is an initiative also in Zurich whereby the, the city and the canton are thinking about creating an innovation park. And, but in a, in a good public partnership, uh, public-private partnership way. So not just something from an ivory tower with lots of tax money that is somewhere put up and the industry then doesn't buy into it. Vice versa, also recognizing that someone has, has to give a little nudge uh, as the private investors would not just do it on their own. They need a bit of, of, of incubation, a bit of uh, help. And that is all part of this innovative spirit that is going on. And as, as I said before, I do believe it's also a, a different mix of generations. I see the the 20-year-olds, uh, young engineering school ETH graduates getting involved in it, and also the baby boomers who are, seem to revive their career rather than thinking about the last third of their career they are visiting, realizing that it's actually a whole new start they can contribute. 
that's quite fascinating. You have the smart minds of, of, of young people put together with expertise of others who have been in the industry. And it's quite an interesting combination. And I find it quite okay to live with a bit of a pirate image. That's, it's for a good cause and that's okay. I do believe it's actually, we are at the crossroads of a lot of very interesting things coming together. Um, we are, we are still, we haven't still figured out uh, the challenge of the disparity or the disequilibrium of wealth. Um, we are geopolitically also in a very interesting times. We have had the fortune of um, Cold War quietening, the benefit of um, not having had World War since at least my, my grandparents. But at the same time, we realize that we also have some side effects of the way we've developed the economy over the last 50 years that we really have to challenge based in, in terms of security, in, in terms of how we use the energy and the scarce resources of our planet. Uh, I do believe we are at, at an interest, interesting tipping point as it regards specifically technology for firms like us. It goes all to trust. I think the key thing is that it seems very obvious why trust is important for a financial service institution. But the very new development, I believe, is that if we make good use of technology, it can be a great enabler to establish trust. Because this technology can be the un a unique source that makes it much more evident to prove the authenticity, which is quite important. It is very authentic. It is very important to know that I am who I am when I deposit money on a bank account or when I redraw it, when I want to obtain a loan, when I claim I am the owner of a property. This may be very straightforward in many countries like India or South America. Even land register rights are not in a cadaster as we know it here. So the whole identity management is quite important to trust for a lot of firms and trust certainly is a, is a key driver and a key prerequisite for companies in the financial service industry. And that is, in my view, really going through a breakthrough and of offering us unique opportunities with new technology. Personally, I also realized that it's not really something that should be seen as, as threatening. And a personal story that, that made this a bit clearer to me is that when, when I came back on one of my trips, my son was asking me, what is this thing called blockchain that I hear once in a while? And he's preparing to go study uh, in law school. So once I had explained it to him, especially in the context of it can make our life better and all that the legal work more automated, he turned around and said, so are you taking away my future job? And I have to say, I have to pause for a moment and said, well, no, actually, we are making it more interesting. Now, it's... These are things we all have to say every day as managers, but it makes you realize the very meaning of that when you're genuinely trying to tell that to your own son and when you're actually thinking through these concepts we often think about is offshore working or automation or robots, are they threatening our work? And it's a real life question when your own son who's prepared to go to get an advanced education asking you that question. And I concluded that yes, I do have a genuine answer, that it's not threatening. It is forcing us to think a little bit different, but if we do it smarter, we actually give also the next generation a great new opportunity to actually reinvent why they get up every morning and why they go to work and make sure they really make best, best use of uh, the degree they studied for and the things they really want to do in life. I think in particular, for a reinsurance firm with a global scope, we have this unique position to connect the dots. It's core to our business that the insurance risks that accumulate are then reinsured to us and we can actually see correlations. We can see how things 
match out to each other. So we have almost a duty to look this, use this unique position to see how risks evolve across the globe and you put that knowledge to good use. I believe we also have a little bit of a, someone once described it to me, image of being a United Nations with a balance sheet attached to it. So it is at the same time, we are of course a publicly quoted private company with the usual demands that the investors have of it. But at the same time, we can actually act almost a little bit as an NGO or United Nations to, whilst we have a return on capital and equity in mind, to actually look over a sufficiently long cycle, not just quarter to quarter, to look over a longer horizon to understand and act upon what's going on in the world. As professionals, you often walk a thin line to be great in your vision, whilst at the same time not to be seen as naive. And I like walking on this uh, fair line, and I do recognize we have to be careful not to make naive assumptions, you know, change world hunger in one day with whatever technology, but we actually are living a very interesting window of opportunity. And I'm surely very, very excited to, to fully embrace that. And even one little step can be a great step for mankind.